This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. We play a lot of music by jazz pianist Brad Meldo on our show in the breaks and at the end of the show. Well, today we have a real treat. Brad Meldow went to the WNYC studios in New York to sit down at their piano for an interview and some music. He spoke with Fresh Air producer Sam Brigger. Here's Sam. Brad Meldow is one of the most influential and acclaimed jazz pianists living today. A recent talk of the town item in The New Yorker said that he is, quote, arguably the greatest working jazz pianist, top five for sure, unquote. His many recordings feature a wide range of jazz and American popular song standards, but he's also known to interpret music that lies outside the typical jazz catalog, playing songs by Radiohead, Nirvana, Nick Drake, and Pink Floyd. In particular, he's had a long relationship with the music of the Beatles. Looking back at his dozens of albums, Beatles songs are peppered throughout, like Blackbird, Martha My Dear, She's Leaving Home, and others. But now for the first time, Meldo has a record of all Beatles songs. Well, except for maybe a David Bowie tune snuck in at the end. The album is called Your Mother Should Know. Brad Meldo plays the Beatles. It was recorded live in Paris in 2020. Meldo's most common musical platform has been his trio, but he's recorded many solo albums and collaborated with musicians such as Josh Redman, Pat Metheny, and Chris Thiele, just to name a few. On his 2018 album called After Bach, he plays pieces from Bach's well-tempered clavier, as well as his own compositions inspired by them. He's very busy touring, so we were lucky to get some time with him while he was in New York, doing a week of gigs at the Village Vanguard, the historic jazz club. Meldow also has a memoir coming out this March called Formation, Building a Personal Canon Part 1, which recounts a difficult childhood and his development as an artist. Well, Brad Meldow, welcome to Fresh Air. Thanks for having me. So in 2018, you had done a a concert of Bach for a concert hall in Paris, and they asked you to come back for 2020, but they wanted you to do uh, just the Beatles songs. Were you enthusiastic about that idea? I was a little apprehensive at first, um, but I had a lot of time on my hands because it was uh, just kind of right in the middle of the lockdown. So I thought, well, this would be um, something exciting to jump into. Um, It was also interesting. They... What they did was they programmed a series of concerts with various artists, and they um, played the whole Beatles repertoire. So everybody, everybody played, everybody picked different tunes. So somebody covered Revolution Number no. Nine somehow. I was wow. always curious how that went. <laughs> yeah. You slightly favor Paul McCartney songs in this album, um, and I think Paul McCartney is known for writing very strong melodies. Do you think that's why you like those songs? I think very strong melodies, but. Um, uh, kind of to make a weird comparison, what I get from Schubert um, is these simple melodies um, under, with with this um, harmony under, it's so beautiful. So I, I think Paul also really is a is a very subtle harmonist, um, and and uh, so yeah, definitely both of those things. Can you give an ex- example of what you mean by his harmonies? Um, well, it's not on the record, but it always comes to mind, you know, maybe because everybody knows it, but just what he does with Blackbird, which I've played a lot over the years. Um, one thing he likes to do is what you call in classical music, maybe you'd call it a pedal point. It's something you find in uh, in Bach and Brahms a lot where there's one, one note that goes through different chords and it's the same note. Um, and in this case, uh, he's getting that from an open G string on the guitar. So you have this beautiful... A harmony that's moving around, but always with that G in the middle of it. And that's always there. So that note's like a home note that's that's throughout the piece. Yeah, yeah, and it's very it, and and it's grounding and and the way it relates to everything, uh, it sort of ties it. It's also something uh, in another uh, that Thelonious Monk loved to do on something like Think of One, where the F is in everything. 
This is. And he has that a lot, you know, on, on, on different tunes of his. So w- why did you pick the song Your Mother Should Know? Whew. Yeah, I just I just love it, and it it's it's just a great example of these kind of you know miniatures that that, that Paul wrote the, these short little uh, songs that that have a, a very specific emotional world, and, and then you're in and out of there in a couple minutes, and um, it sort of leaves leaves you hanging, you know, and it, like it, can, it and and it's um it's wistful, uh, which is is an emotion I get from 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 Paul a lot. It's kind of sad, happy, happy, sad. Well, would you play a little bit of us for us? Sure. That's great. Thanks so much for doing that. <laughs> kind of random. <laughs> Sorry. I no. tried to pack a lot in. And <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that actually answers my my next question. I was wondering how much of these are arranged that you would be playing the same all the time, but that the way you just play that now was a lot different than the version on the album. Yeah, yeah. I did think about that a lot. And, and in the case of that one, I hewed quite closely to the arrangement as they had it. And, and one fun thing about this record was it was sort of a – an orchestrational challenge. Um, there's so much complexity uh, to their music in all these different instruments and things happening, um, and then trying to bring that all onto the piano was a was a fun challenge. And then some imp- improvising in there, kind of short, but they're great chords, you know. And then this very strange interlude, and then it's and then it's just over in, in, in it's so many so many elements there all at once. In a couple minutes, you know, a lot of Paul McCartney songs sound like they could be from a, like a, a different era, and I think they harken back to like the music of his parents. Like his dad was a, a swing band leader, and you actually you say that you say this in a good way, but some of the Beatles songs sound frumpy to you. <laughs> right, right, yeah. I use that that you know sort of in a in an endearing way. Um, there's a swing feeling in there. Um, but it's this kind of wistful, humorous thing uh, that that Paul brings to it, which is no doubt, uh, like you said, the music that he heard, I think, when he was growing up, and he said that in some interviews I've heard. So in the version of the song Here, There, and Everywhere on the album, you stick to the melody pretty closely like throughout your performance, but you kind of, you're reharmonizing the song as you're going along, like you're playing different chords underneath the melody and what that does to my ears, it like it transforms the melody because it has a different relationship to the chords. Could you uh, explain that and uh, and also maybe give us a demonstration? Yeah, that was that was one example of where I really said, well, let me let me step outside of the original. Uh, obviously, the the original harmony is just is so beautiful and righteous, um, and and so I sort of come back to it here and there, but. Um, <laughs> I, I think the model for that is is one of my top heroes, uh, Herbie Hancock, and and what he did with Miles, what he did on his own records, is in an in an improvisational context. Um, uh, exactly what you say, reharmonizing, putting different uh, harmony, and and the only rule there really is to somehow make it connect with the melody. And when you get into the chromatic harmony that's possible, um, the sky's the limit. You know, as I would like to say, you're always half a step away from something. You know. <laughs> So how does that sound with here, there, and everywhere? So if you have the original, it's, you know, it's very uh, diatonic. And then so I might. And 
then maybe come back to it, you know, sort of ground it again of here's five going back to one. Mm. Does that sort of thing work better when you have a strong melody to work with? Oh, that's a, that's a great point. Absolutely. It works really well um, with a, you know, a diatonic, which means, you know, all within one scale. In this case, it's in uh, G major. So, you know, everything is within that scale, I think. I hope I'm not going to be wrong. So that's all, you know, just in one scale. So uh, even though they have different chords, uh, it's, it's, uh, it has a simplicity there to work from. If you're just joining us, we're talking to jazz pianist Brad Meldow, who has a new album called Your Mother Should Know. Brad Meldow plays the Beatles. More after a break. This is Fresh Air. We're speaking with jazz pianist Brad Meldow. He has a new solo album called Your Mother Should Know. Brad Meldow plays the Beatles. Here's his version of I Am the Walrus. That's Brad Maldow playing I Am The Walrus. I asked him why he chose the song for his new album. Yeah, I remember that when I first heard this um, song, I, I, I think I heard it on the radio. It was one of those ones I, I did hear when I was a kid. And, and this one, Strawberry Fields Forever, some, some of the ones from Magical Mystery Tour, um, they, I just found them disturbing and I didn't, I didn't really like them too much. Um, also, for the benefit of Mr. Kite, you know, they were sort of like, a, like not necessarily a nightmare, but one of those dreams you have that's kind of weird. Um, but with I Am the Walrus, the, the harmony is so interesting. I remember I had this album as, a, as when I was a kid, and the end of this song is, is there's a lot of cacophony and there's a lot of weird stuff going on. There's like this weird chorus of some of people singing oompa oompa, yeah. Yeah. stick it in your jumper, and then there's these old men talking. And I would just put the needle back over and over again to hear that part of the song and trying I, to figure out what, yeah. <laughs> or just what what's going on <laughs> like yeah, yeah. Like, like trying to figure out what they're saying I, so i imagine that that was a particularly hard part to figure out how to play because it's like there's so it's just so dense sonically yeah yeah well there's a lot going on in that song and there's these sections you know but the ending is really cool because it's again it's it's diatonic and, and it's almost um willfully naive what they do they just start on A's in, in unison, and then they just go the other direction. You can do it on the white keys of the piano. So what they're doing is just going in other directions, down on the bottom and up on the top. So it's... Keeps on going. <laughs> that's a very, very condensed um, 20 times as fast, <laughs> right, you know. Right. So I had a fun time doing on that on the piano and getting into a little, I wouldn't say virtuosic, but but really kind of fleshing that out on the piano. Yeah, that that's a really cool part of your rendition. Would you mind playing a little bit of this? Sure, maybe I'll do that ending. So okay, I great. Whip it off, I don't know.
that's great. That's that's hair raising. No. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> yeah. The uh, the interesting thing about that, like the song fades. It's unlike there's another song, A Day in the Life, where they sort of do get to that. That's resolution, true. It does fade. But, yeah, but that's right. That's I'm right. glad you. I'm glad you don't fade out. You yeah, I guess uh, I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> thinking of my version because the it's literally the it's in A minor at that point, and, uh-huh. and of course the A is the lowest note on the piano, which I love to play if I have an excuse <laughs> to play. <laughs> yeah. Um, I read that in your 20s you decided to spend more time with classical music in order to develop your left hand a little bit more. Um, were there particular composers that you concentrated on? Certainly Bach. I, I, I really went headlong into the well-tempered clavier. Um, and um, I, I think it was, uh, for whatever reason, I, I always, uh, Brahms was a composer who was just really close to my heart when I when I played Brahms' music for the first time when I was a kid. And then when I got to New York, I don't know why that was, but I really started discovering more of his music and sort of went on a mission. Um, his chamber music, his choral music, his four symphonies, everything, his leader. Um, and then just from all of that, there's, you know, in that piano literature, there's always a call to do stuff with your left hand. You know, people think of Bach a lot, certainly, but, you know, in, in Brahms and Beethoven, you know, in, in all these composers, um, there's there's things that the left hand, you know, that, that don't come as much in. And I, and I wouldn't want to say that, you know, jazz, you don't have to use your left hand as much, but there's a certain kind of jazz that's a lot of... Um, a time period that that's that's my grits and gravy, which is kind of beginning with bebop and and going through you know modern stuff, you know, right up through the middle '60s, let's say, where the piano is in a rhythm section, and the left hand is playing a role that's a chord. It doesn't play melodies as much, so so it doesn't uh, need to be used in that way. Um, as a result of that, um, because I hadn't been playing classical music, I stopped classical lessons when I was uh, 13 and then went headlong into jazz. So my, my left hand, by the time I was 19, was in a way it wasn't as strong as it was when I was 13. You know, it didn't have the fluidity. So I, it was sort of a, a little bit of an ego thing of, you know, just I, I want to get this back, you know. And then did you start incorporating more complicated left hand movements within your playing in jazz? Yeah, yeah, that kind of, kind of happened uh intuitively and, and, and naturally. And of course, there were jazz pianists who, who are, you know, at the top of the heap for that. Um, in the small group, um, uh, certainly Oscar Peterson, who was one of the first ones. Uh, his left hand was unbelievable. Phineas Newborn, another one. And Art Tatum, you know, for going uh, earlier into that, that, that earlier style. So there, there were one, those ones as well were, um, you know, big lights for me. I want to play something. This is from earlier in your career. Um, This is with your trio. It's from The Art of the Trio, Volume 2, Live at the Village Vanguard. And you're playing the Thelonious Monk song, Monk's Dream. And this, to me, it sounds like you're really doing independent things with your right hand and your left hand. It's a really intense part of your solo where there's just these waves of sound, but you still hear the melody like woven through. But first, just before we listen to that, could you just play this, like the simple melody for Monk's Dream so we can hear it? Yeah, so so let's hear you playing this live with your trio. Um, This is Monk's Dream. Let's take a short break here. If you're just joining us, our guest is the jazz pianist and composer Brad Meldow. His new album is called Your Mother Should Know. Brad Meldow plays the Beatles. More after a break. This is Fresh Air.
This message comes from NPR sponsor, First Republic Bank. You set your financial goals years ago, and now you're reaching them. This year, you're ready to do more than you thought because you didn't come this far to only come this far. With First Republic, you get a personal banker, a consistent point of contact who's ready to help you go the rest of the way. Learn more at firstrepublic.com. Member FDIC. Equal housing lender. This is Fresh Air. I'm Sam Brigger sitting in for Terry Gross. And right now, seated at a piano bench in a studio at WMYC is jazz pianist and composer Brad Meldow, who's joined us for a conversation and some music. The acclaimed musician has a new album called Your Mother Should Know. Brad Meldow plays the Beatles. He also has a memoir coming out in March titled Formation, Building a Personal Canon, Part One. So, Brad, as I said, uh, you have a memoir coming out in March called Formation, um, and it's the story of your youth and development as an artist. It's it's very personal, and it's it's a pretty distressing read. Um, You felt like an outsider a lot of your youth, in part because you were adopted, uh, you, but you were also you were bullied as a kid. You were sexually groomed by your high school principal, and the traumas of your childhood led led you to feel alienated as a young adult, confused about your sexuality, and and as you say, filled with self-loathing, for which you sought relief in alcohol and drugs, eventually heroin, which almost led to your death. Wh- why at this point in your life did you decide to write this book and and publish it? She is pretty heavy when you hear it all back like that. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's all in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it had been sort of this big blob on a hard drive for at least 15 years. And, and there were pieces of it there uh, about some of um, the kind of political slash musical discussion. There were a couple of the memories. Um, so I, I knew I had a book in there somewhere, but I think for whatever reason... Um, over the years, I, I found a story in there, and I think um, it, for whatever reason, it took kind of half a lifetime later past the actual events to get the story right. Um, and the way that's played out for me as a musician is that I think in, in some very kind of mysterious way, a, a lot of those really difficult experiences made me the musician um, that I am, you know, for instance, this kind of loneliness and alienation that I experienced. Um, uh, I, I think, and I don't like to analyze myself too much, but I think there's a kind of something that I can get to, for instance, in playing a ballad uh, and, and sort of going in this interior zone that's informed by, you know, experiences that I, that I wouldn't have asked for, you know, at the time, you know. You said that you always felt apart from other people and that at first you kind of felt that that meant you were inferior, but that you were able to sort of transform that feeling and imagine it like that you were sort of this cool outsider. And you say that you even thought of yourself as somehow marked as different, like like Cain from the Bible, you, Cain who kills his brother Abel, God marks him for that act. Can, can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, I think, you know, in, in the book, I'm talking about some of these experiences, sort of how I, I always knew I was adopted. Um, and it wasn't a traumatic, messed up adoption by any means, but I think uh, there's there's a little sketch I give there of, of when I felt how that was different when we were doing this um, family tree thing in fifth grade, um, and 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 that experience. And and then as I as I got older, I discovered you know that my my sexuality was fluid, and and you know, um, and it was 1984 or whatever. And then I had these really not so great experiences um, that I describe in the book too that that all gave it a negative hue um, and and so then I wanted to make a story about that so I think so I think the Kane story was uh, a way of 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 sort of making that special and and when I read that that sort of reverse reading of of the Cain and Abel it was in Herman Hesse's great uh, early novel Damien uh, where he talks about that, you know, everybody says that that Cain was, you know, he was marked and then he was banished and, and God put a mark on him. But um, Hess has this idea that the that the character uh, Damien is explaining that no, actually, it was the other way around. You know, that that Damien, that that Cain was really he was special and, and and he was cooler than everyone. You know, so it was it was a story that I tried to put on myself, but but in in fact, it wasn't really quite right. You know, because there was still there was still the, the pain involved with it, you know, but it, but it was a, it was a way that I 
started to differentiate myself, probably in a way that wasn't very helpful. So when you were in high school, there were all these cliques, and you didn't really feel like you fit into a lot of them. There was a jazz clique, but but there was a lot of, you were dealing with a lot of bullying, but you you fell into um, a group of older musicians, jazz musicians, who would hire you on to to go to weddings and play at parties, and then you actually even had like a, a I think a regular gig at a club in Hartford called the 880. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And... Um, and with these older musicians, you kind of found a community. What was it like hanging out with all these old guys? It was really fun. You know, there was one in particular, uh, Larry Denatale, um, who's a drummer who gave me, um, and also Joel Fromm, who's a, a fantastic uh, tenor saxophonist, and another guy, Pat Zimmerly now, who's a, um, a classical composer. He gave us all um, a chance. Um, you know, we were just really beginning, and he gave us a gig uh, at the 880. Uh, and he mentored us, you know, and and that's that's really important. Um, and and he was my first model for a, a, a bohemian jazz musician, and I loved it. Um, you know, bohemian in the sense of um, he said whatever he wanted. He didn't live in in the kind of suburban. We we lived in in West Hartford, which was a very suburban kind of conservative. Um, nothing particularly bad about it, but kind of stifling. And 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 that was the model for me. Um, and also a kindness there too, you know, um, and and that's what I experienced as, as when I came to New York, and I started meeting older jazz musicians who were also mentor figures like Jimmy Cobb, the the great Jimmy Cobb, the the, the drummer, and uh, Junior Mance, the pianist who I studied with, um, different musicians I worked with. Uh, there there was a there was a kindness there as well. Um, so it pretty much nothing but positive in that sense for these older models, you know, which which definitely I, I think was made me think, yeah, I, I, I want to do this. So, you you know, you were in New York in the late 80s when there were just these lots of jazz clubs, um, some of them which no longer exist. And you could go and see terrific musicians like every night, like veterans of the bebop era and hard bop era were still playing. What what were some of the acts you would go see? Well, there was, a, there was a, I mean, really the one as a pianist, um, you know, or just any jazz musician was um, Bradley's, which was on university, I think, in 12th or 13th. And that was that was really the piano room. Um, and so, you know, always somebody on a top level and, and always of that generation. I don't think they really, w- when Bradley was around, um, he, he wouldn't book younger art, you know. So that was Cedar Walton, that was Tommy Flanagan, that was Barry Harris, Kenny Barron, Hank Jones, um, yeah, players, players on that level. So they were players that they were pianists I had been listening to on on records for the last four years, uh, and then and then now I was getting it. I'd go into Bradley's and and I'd, I'd sit at the bar if I was lucky. I'd get this seat, you know, close to the action and just, and you know, uh, incredible, just sublime to to be witnessing that. Would you ever go up to them and say, "Excuse me, sir, I'm I'm a jazz pianist myself," or was that were you too nervous to do that? I was too nervous. I don't think I ever approached any of them. You didn't. Um, know. Yeah, I was just too. I was always kind of shy. Um, I, you know, McCoy Tyner was another titan um, for me, and and to me, he had you know with the work he did in, in the in the classic Coltrane Quartet. Um, there's a spiritual authority. Those 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 guys were like. Um, they were like priests, you know, in the music. They uh, And I remember I'd go to Sweet Basil's to see him play with his trio, and I'd be there sitting at the bar, and he'd come up, and, and he'd have his tonic water, and he'd be sitting next to me at the bar, and I couldn't talk to him. I couldn't. I just I couldn't, you know. That would have been the moment, you know. Would you try to absorb some of him just sitting there? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I guess so. You know, just sort of try not to look at him, but be looking at him, you know. So when you were young, you know, you would emulate your heroes. Like one night you'd go out and maybe you'd sound like McCoy Tyner or maybe Bobby Bobby Timmons. But you say you went on the road with the alto sax player Christopher Holliday. And uh, and you say you came back with your own style. What what changed out on the road? I think it was, it was interesting because it's not something I realized myself, but it was the first road gig I got. And, um, and um, we went out for a good eight months, kind of really hitting it hard, um, you know, playing five nights a week uh, in the States. And I think just the 
the act of playing so much live, like I was saying earlier, you you change as a player, you know, from what you study and listen to and all that work, but you you really change in the gig to gig experience. And somehow having that regular gig, when I when I came back, um, friends of mine like um, like Samia Hell, the, the the pianist, and uh, Peter Bernstein, and, and different people who I played a lot with in in, in New York, they said, "Wow, you." you've got something that's different now. It's like it kind of, you know, it's kind of like your thing, man. And, and, and I couldn't see it myself, but I think that was maybe when I started to get something that I recognize as, as me. Um, how would you describe you? Oh. <laughs> well, I would describe me by, by, you know, everybody else, you know. It's uh, an amalgamation of, of everything, everything I love, you know. Um, so it's... It's all those all those players I named. It's you know it's Billy Joel, it's Brahms, <laughs> it's all of it put together, and then you mix that with my personality. And I think maybe what I have a talent for um, is some way of assimilating it um, versus sort of. Uh, paraphrasing different players, you know, which can also be good. And there's a lot of, you know, um, players who do that really well, who are like, oh, now he's doing this Errol Garner thing, and now it goes into some Winton Kelly. And, you know, it's, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, but I think my talent is more sort of bringing them together. Um, and so you might not know who it is, you know. For instance, when I tell people um, who who's informing a performance if someone says, I really liked what you did there and, and it reminded me of uh, uh, Radiohead. I said, well, yeah, actually that's more from Chopin or vice versa, you know. So, so maybe people don't even know what those influences are and, you, and you've sort of managed to make them your own to a degree, but it's still it's from all that stuff. You incorporate a lot of different styles into your playing. Can you sort of show us like the difference between like sort of modal playing and maybe like more bebop lines, like how those sound different, the tonalities there? Yeah. Um, so if, if we're going back to a C blues, uh, mm -hmm. same tempo, uh, a more bebop would be. And then same tempo, same key, uh, C blues, more in a modal sort of, I'll say uh, McCoy and Herbie, let's say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So the second one, you're sort of going outside the harmony a little bit more? Is yeah, going outside of the harmony and uh, a little more, if I'm in a mode, it's more a mode and not a diatonic bass. So that gets really into kind of in the weeds, uh, musical, <laughs> yeah, wonky <laughs> stuff, yeah. But you if, know what I mean. That's because you're asking the question, so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, as a piano player, you can't head out on the road with your instrument strapped to your back. You have to kind of play the hall or the club's piano. Does that prove challenging? Definitely, yeah, yeah. And I have a fantastic uh, tour manager and sound engineer, Vincent Rousseau, who I've been with for um, almost 20 years. So we um, go around and we collect the serial numbers of all the Steinways. And, um, and then we give a simple grading system from one to four, um, and there's even a zero, and a zero means absolutely never play that again. <laughs> yeah. And and then one is you'd really have to fix this up, you know, all the way to four, which I've only um, I've only had two fours in the 15 or so years we've been doing it. So f four is the golden, incredible Steinway D. Um, and and so uh, so that's 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 one way uh, of of trying to sort of police it, you know, because what you have a lot is you have a promoter um, 
who will say, uh, you get, and the, and the piano sounds atrocious, and then they'll say, oh, well, so-and-so played it. You know, I always no, used to they get, loved it, yeah. Chick Corea played it, you yeah. know, uh, three months ago, and uh, he loved it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you never know whether that's true. The other thing that happens is that a piano can be really um, great, and then a year later, um, it's, it doesn't sound as good. They need to be maintained. Um, you can't just have a Steinway. Just because it's a Steinway, it's going to be great. You know, they have to be regulated and voiced and everything. Well, what, what do you do when you come a, a, upon a zero or a one? Like, do you just have to make do? There's only been, I think, maybe two times where I've downright refused. Um, and I've never called off a concert. But um, then they came through and they got another piano. Um, but no, most of the time, uh, it's it's making, yeah, making do with what it is, trying to work with the technician who's there to try to, you know, do a little damage control and, and then, and then make do with what is. And then again, like I was mentioning earlier, don't tell the audience and complain, you know, that's the most frustrating part because you're playing and let's say a lot, a lot of problems you encounter with a piano that's not in good shape is that it has no dynamic range because of the, the condition the hammers are in. Um, you have, instead of being able to play pianissimo to fortissimo, you have a range that's more like mezzo piano to mezzo forte, or only loud, you know. And then you have to make do with that, and then, you know, you play the concert, and someone says, oh, it was great, and blah, 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 and you just think, I could have showed you so much more, you know. But you can't say that, you know. So uh, that's that's the most frustrating part, I think. It's like, if only they knew what I could do, you know, if this piano was in good shape. If you're just joining us, we're talking to jazz pianist Brad Meldow, who has a new album called Your Mother Should Know. Brad Meldow plays the Beatles. More after a break. This is Fresh Air. As I said before, in your memoir, you talk about the difficulties you had um, stopping using heroin. You were addicted to heroin um, for many years. And, you know, recovering addicts are often told to avoid like the people they did drugs with or like, or even the places where they did drugs right. or the kinds of places that they did drugs. Um, and jazz is a music of the night and, and clubs. And I was wondering if that can be difficult for you sometimes. I mean, looking at your touring schedule, you're often playing concert halls, but you also play at clubs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting that time period I'm, I'm writing about when, when, when I was uh, in the addiction. Um, uh, there were only a few other jazz musicians who were getting into that. And, and I think it was more of something that was going on in the 90s with, with heroin, um, which, um, you know, you had like supermodels doing it and A-list actors. And it, and it was something. So that was something more that I found. Um, I was using heroin with, you know, NYU students and, and, you know, people, people who were, uh, these, you know, kind of privileged kids like myself. Um, so, so I didn't get pulled too much into the classic, um, you know, idea that you have with, with heroin and, and jazz. I think that time had already sort of come and gone, you know, the idea that like Charlie Parker did heroin. So I should probably, do yeah, exactly. Too. Exactly. Is it hard to, for you to listen to music that you recorded from that period? Not so much. I mean, wh what I do hear um, is that there was, and I kind of try to stress this in the book, I, I probably should have underlined it more, is that um, it wasn't so much that I, I, it impeded my playing, but I was kind of on autopilot um, in the sense that I wasn't developing. I had this natural thing I could do, and, and it even had something that was my own. But it wasn't developing. And I remember that I, I finally got clean. I, I, I went to a, a rehab in, in Los Angeles, and then I stayed there. And uh, I got my Steinway B that I still have now, and, and I had an apartment, and I started practicing and, and, and you know getting on my feet again. And it just flowed. All of a sudden, I was writing, and, and, um, and my playing was developing in, in a way that— uh, and then it just went from there. So it really only flourished— um, so I can listen to that, but that, that's, that's what I'm aware of most of all is that it's kind of this autopilot, you know, in a way. You know, in your memoir, the young Brad Meldow comes across as a pretty unhappy person, someone not at home in the world. Um, but, you know, the book ends, I think you're like in your late tw 20s, almost 30 at that point. Um, you're now in your early 50s. You're married. You have three kids. You couldn't ask for a more successful musical career. You're considered one of the most important jazz musicians of your generation. 
like have you found your place in the world are you do you feel more comfortable in your own skin yeah definitely definitely um things are things are just easier that uh, as you get older you know i, I think i think uh, thank goodness otherwise <laughs> i don't know i i think um, yeah, i had a friend read the, the the manuscript early on who was with me for a lot of that and he said wow man this is pretty depressing you know and if because i remember we had a, a lot of good times too you know and and that certainly was the case too so i i tried to describe some of the you know the ecstasy of hearing all this great music and some close friendships but it's it's definitely a, a, a dark story there and and um yeah thank goodness things haven't been dark i'm i'm, I'm blessed now really well, I'm, I'm happy to hear that um i was hoping that you would play a little bit of golden slumbers um as we end this interview this is a another paul mccartney song that you describe in your liner notes as an amen inducing ballad <laughs> why why did you pick this song um you know it's it's that zone of paul where these i think these um um these kind of cadences that are uh, yeah they it, it's like it has a church quality to it you know another let it be hey jude have that um, and then you see on his first solo record, uh, right after um, this this one, uh, Abbey Road, uh, there's a tune, Maybe I'm Amazed, that's just a great one. Uh, that's the same kind of amen thing. Well, Brad Maldow, thank you so much for being here today on Fresh Air. Thanks for having me, Sam. Brad Meldow spoke with Fresh Air producer Sam Brigger. His new album, Your Mother Should Know, Brad Meldow Plays the Beatles, comes out this week. We'd like to thank WNYC for letting us use their studio and their piano, and engineer Irene Trudell for recording Meldow. Fresh Air's executive producer is Danny Miller. Our technical director and engineer is Audrey Bentham. Our interviews and reviews are produced and edited by Amy Sallett, Phyllis Myers, Sam Brigger, Lauren Krenzel, Heidi Simon, Teresa Madden, Anne Marie Bodonato, Thea Chaloner, Seth Kelly, Susan Yakundi, and Joel Wolfram. Our digital media producer is Molly C.V. Nesper. Roberta Shorrock directs the show. I'm Terry Gross. <laughs>